Good morning, colleagues, uh, and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Devolution Further Powers Committee of 2015. Just remind members to switch off their mobile phones or at least put them into a, a silent mode. I think that would be very helpful. Agenda item one uh, on the Scotland Bill, proposals for the, the devolution of welfare powers. It's the only item we have on our agenda today, and we're taking evidence um, in regard to that and proposals for the devolution of further welfare powers. And our witnesses today are uh, Mike O'Donnell, Head of Partnership at Skills Development Scotland. Morning. Uh, morning. Judith Batherson, Welfare Rights Coordinator at the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland. Um, Fiona Colley, who is the Policy and Public Affairs Manager at Carer Scotland, and Pamela Smith, who is the Deputy Chair of the Scottish Local Authorities Economic Development Network. Welcome to you all, and thank you very much for coming along and helping us with our deliberations this morning. Uh, I just want to open with a, a very general question um, to, to try to get the, the scene set, if we, if, if we could do that. Um, obviously, a significant bit of the Scotland Bill covers the welfare area, which you're all involved in, uh, and you'll have some expertise in. Uh, and therefore, I just wonder, do you foresee any practical challenges of delivering the new powers, especially in terms of how the devolved benefits interact with those that remain reserved, and how the new benefit system in Scotland fits in with the tax raising powers or the tax credit framework? I don't know who'd like to kick that off with that very general question. You're all looking down, so I'll pick on somebody. Mike, good on okay, you. Um, I, I suppose what, uh, from, a, from a Skills Development Scotland perspective, what we are currently doing is looking at the current cohort of, um, of, uh, of programmes uh, that we deliver across Scotland and to ensure that um, there's a good fit with uh, uh, universal credit, um, which has been rolled out, as you know, in the, at the current time. I suppose uh, what we've identified is... Uh, with a particular regard to the employability fund, um, the, the, the proposed restriction, if you like, um, that, uh, that the UK government would place on training at last for more than eight weeks. And, um, and uh, we've got um, some reservations about that. We, we also know that, 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 that there's been, that, that government has, um, uh, has allowed a, a period up until April 2016 uh, for, for that to be, um, a, if, you, if, you, if you like, relaxed in, the, in, in, in a Scottish context. Uh, but uh, SDS has been working with Scottish Government and indeed with DWP in Scotland uh, and, we've, uh, and we've, we've asked UK Government to respond to uh, some, uh, some questions we've got about how it would fit with, um, with the Employability Fund. So, for example, uh, employability Fund uh, within Scotland delivers across the Skills and Employability Pipeline at stages two to four. And um, the, uh, that each episode, uh, each stage is considered to be a separate episode of training. And uh, a question we're asking is, will DWP um, in the rollout of universal credit also deal with it that way so that it would be eight weeks for each episode of training rather than collectively as people trans make a transition from stage two to stage three to stage four? That and the other, the, the other thing it talks about is basic skills. We've asked for a definition. What, is, you know, what are basic skills? Because um, what DWP are also saying is that um, there may be some relaxation uh, around basic skills, eight weeks, um, but for basic skills, there may be more time allowed for that, and uh, we're awaiting a, def a definition on that. So that and uh, some other, other questions that we've asked um, DWP um, and the UK government to clarify uh, for us. That's helpful, actually. That's mainly areas of clarity you're looking for. Okay. Yes. Thanks, yeah. mate. Judith? Yes. Um, I think there are considerable delivery challenges. I think, generally speaking, we already know that the current system has um, a lot of areas that cause problems for claimants, and the evidence for that is a very strong link with food bank use, linked to errors and delays in the administration of, of benefits. And uh, together with that, our CPG's own early warning system, which gathers evidence of impacts of welfare reforms on claimants, shows uh, a very high incidence of error in the system. Something like 40% of our cases um, 
gathered through the early warning system um, are about error and delay. So obviously there's a lot already known about problems in the system, which gives us an opportunity to address those very early on when new benefits are actually being developed. So um, there's, there's certainly not um, necessary that these, that these problems are, are um, brought into the new system. So as, as the structure of the benefit system is actually developed, it can be developed in a more simple, straightforward way. The more complexity there is, the more um, room there is for clashes and jagged edges in the system that impact on claimants. And there's an opportunity as well to make sure that the delivery systems themselves offer a, a streamlined, seamless journey for claimants. And we would suggest that, that in designing that, um, the Scottish Government puts at the heart those vulnerable claimants that so often are at the, um, at the sharp edge of these problems. I, I suppose just, just alongside that, I think there are also particular opportunities here at the moment to um, alleviate child poverty, particularly with regard to the welfare cuts and this new tranche of welfare cuts as well. I think there are opportunities within the Scotland Bill um, to top up reserve benefits and to create new benefits to help uh, claimants manage those cuts. Fiona? Um, I think, not surprising, I'm going to uh, basically say about some specifics around um, carers allowance and, 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 and new carers benefit. I think our, I don't think we underestimate the scale of the challenge that's going to face the Scottish Government and indeed um, the, the reserve benefit system. Um, however, the, there are some questions that really we, we, we will need answers to, particularly in, in order that we're going to be able to start reassuring carers about what the system is going to look like in the future. Um, I think first and foremost is the issue of, of clawback. Um, if, if the, the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament were to choose to increase carers allowance would that simply then just be removed off, to, off of um, universal credit income support or pension credit? Um, uh, secondly, there's some, there's some issues around um, whether the, the, the new benefit would be considered to be an overlapping benefit. Now, that has um, considerable um, implications about what that might look like. Um, if there's a decision that it's not an overlapping benefit, i.e. not an earnings replacement benefit, then we are looking at um, potentially um, a, in the future pensioners being eligible. And, and there's a strong um, vocal element, a vocal number of carers who say it's not fair that carers allowance stops when they reach state pension age. If the overlapping benefit rule is not there, um, then we actually need to look at what, what, what the financial um, implications are um, as well as, as the, the practical and, and I think um, moral case for carers who are over 65 to, to, to retain carers allowance. Um, there's also um, around um, the question around the carers credit and the credit to national insurance from any new benefit that was created and it's very important it's, it, to ensure that carers retain um, that national insurance credit um, because carers allowance may be their, own in their only income um, and to enable them to ensure that they can have um, a, at least a, a reasonable pension when they retire on the backdrop that they have lost significant amounts of income through not being able to work or having to reduce their hours. Um, we want to be very clear that that national insurance credit will continue. Pamela? Yes. <clears throat> First, I'd like to maybe just set a context around the welfare reform and local government's interest, and in particular, our interest around the conditionality and sanctions and the employability uh, agenda. Uh, last year, local government supported 25,000 unemployed job seekers into employment, and with 67,000 uh, vulnerable individuals participating in employability programmes, Picking up what Mike has said earlier, the conditionality and sanctions regime, um, there will certainly be jagged edges because the question is to what degree Scottish Government 
will have the freedom and flexibility to redesign programmes such as a work programme or work choice if the condition is dictated by DWP in terms of participation by hours, by weeks, by content. And what we might find is that we are developing and designing employability programmes to meet a sanctions and conditionality regime as opposed to meeting the needs of individuals, particularly the more vulnerable individuals who may be disallowed from participating in activity that will actually um, help their confidence, motivation, particularly those with disabilities, those with additional support needs, um, those ex-offenders, people who traditionally the work programme uh, has failed in terms of 68% of those completing the work programme remain unemployed at the end of it. And if the Scottish Government are going to revamp and redesign uh, a programme that at least supports more than half of those people who participate into employment, then the freedom and flexibility to do that, I think, is going to be impaired by the conditionality and sanctions um, because the, the money in the programme the legislative framework uh, will come with so many conditions um, that it's almost a poison chalice for Scottish Government and for local government because we also fund our local programmes. We have uh, our European Social Fund employability pipeline money and the participation uh, conditions will be the same whether it's a Scottish Government SDS administered or funded programme or whether it's a local government. The other uh, thing I'd like to highlight is our interest is in employability is because of the relationship with poverty and inequality and the, the well-being of our community. We know that people who are in well-paid sustainable employment are healthier and those communities are healthier uh, and more prosperous. So there is an issue also around people in work. We know that um, children live, living in poverty, there is a working adult in the household, the majority of children now living in, in poverty. And the conditionality and sanctions regime will also apply to those in work who rely on working tax credit or in work um, benefit. Uh, and again, they will be encouraged to take low hour contracts, uh, contracts that might not meet their personal and financial needs uh, or again face uh, sanctions and there is an issue for government, Scottish government, local government, how do we deliver in work support to enable people to up their skills levels and uh, to enable them to improve their earnings potential uh, and to increase their hours as well. So there is a lot of jagged edges around the conditionality and the sanctions and how we actually lift people out of poverty uh, and how we improve and connect with the whole fair work agenda. Uh, also, there is a question around how the government get more policy coherence. So if we have policies around the Scottish Business Pledge, around using uh, a number of instruments to implement social policy. How are we going to be able to do that? A further example of reserved matters, maybe not strictly linked to welfare, but it's another example. The apprenticeship levy at the minute, which is out for consultation, where the UK government, uh, because PAYE uh, is reserved, will levy an apprenticeship uh, amount on large employers of 250 or more. Now, at the minute, we have no guarantee that any of that money will come back to Scotland for training because apprenticeships and training is a devolved matter. Uh, local government and public <coughs> bodies will also be subject to that levy. Uh, so again, there's another issue there where we have training and skills devolved, but a national levy through HMRC applied on the PAYE of large employers. So there's a whole load of issues for us where there are jagged edges and how we can achieve our aspirations and ambitions alongside powers that are reserved at Westminster. I've got a couple of people who want to ask supplementaries, Rob, before I come back to carers and specifically about that point you make there about the national insurance contribution towards apprenticeship scheme is going to become quite an that issue will become more relevant as we get through to the Scottish government budget process, because if I understand it correctly, 
between the costs of the national insurance and the pension contribution to help support that training activity, it's now amounting to something like £300 million will have to be paid out to the Scottish Public Services back to the Treasury. Do you think in these circumstances there's an argument that says that Scotland should keep that money to reinvest ourselves back into training? Well, given that apprenticeships and skills is devolved, there is no guarantee that that money coming out of the public sector and the large businesses. And again, it dep we don't know the detail of how it's going to be levied on the large businesses, but at the minute, the government, through SDS, pay a contribution to the training costs. Now, when money's getting tighter, businesses may fail to invest if they think they're already paying twice. We already have the construction industry and <coughs> construction scales where there is a levy and the engineering sector where there is a levy. And again, how will that rub alongside that and how will the local authorities be able to, as well as public sector, invest in our workforce of the future if we have a double whammy, if it's coming off, it could be 0.5 or 1 per cent. We don't know the value yet either. Um, if it comes back to Scottish Government in block grant, is it part of a lower settlement overall? Is it ring fence for skills development? You know, so there are so many unknown uh, variables at the minute. The consultation only closed on the 2nd of October. Um, and I'm sure Scottish Government, like others, have made those representations. Can I, can I just understand from the panel, of others aware of this issue and what consultation, um, what interaction have you had with the UK government in particular on this? Have you written to the UK government about it? Has anyone, Pamela, has your organisation done that? We have, COSLA has written, uh, and as far as I'm aware, Scottish government have made representations through uh, Rosanna Cunningham's office, and I believe SDS were also uh, looking at the issue as well. Yeah, can, could, yeah, 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 it, could, can, Pam, first sorry. of all, Mike, can, can we get a copy of that, if that's possible, of just the, so we, we can, can understand it a bit more? Because, the, uh, I would have thought it was something that, we, well, obviously, we're quite interested in stuff to do around the fiscal framework. Yeah. And as this fiscal framework develops, it's going to be important that we, we nail down these sort of issues to make sure the Scottish position is as fair as it can be, and we're doing no harm to Scotland in agreeing that fiscal yeah. framework. So that would be helpful. Mike? The SDS's response is via the discussions through uh, with the Scottish Government on that. Um, so, um, so, so we, have a, we are having dialogue, but it's been through the Scottish Government. I think the I think the other thing to say that anything that supports employers to uh, take on modern apprenticeships, uh, modern apprentices, um, is, uh, um, is is something that we are trying to support. And we've also got a government ask at the present time to look at increasing the number of um, apprenticeships that, that we deliver across Scotland from 25 yeah. to 30,000. And, um, and uh, any levy that's, that, that, that's put on employers um, makes it more difficult, um, obviously, for us to, yeah, um, to, uh, to engage with employers. Or I hope that they'll come forward and uh, offer apprenticeship opportunities. Okay. Um, Linda, I think, had a supplementary, as did Tavish. So. Yeah, I think it was generally about some of the things that were said, uh, convener. Thank you, and thank you for these it turned into presentations as opposed to answers, which were really interesting. I, th I think, Judith, it was something you said that set my train of thought going. Um, you were saying, as a new benefit system develops, can it be structured in a better way? Um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you here. And that brought me back to concerns I had when I sat on the Welfare Reform Committee. Was like It seemed to me that there was a bit of an expectation beyond what we're actually studying at the moment in terms of the clauses of the Scotland Bill that are in front of us and what we will be able to do. And that brings me on to, to the issues of top-ups, um, sanctions and how we deal with that. We've already talked about um, you know, national insurance and pension um, changes that you know, may well take money out of the Scottish budget. And, of course, we now have people who are going to be suffering from the tax credit regime changing. And I think my, my concern is that there's a bit of an expectation that everything um, that happens can be sorted once the Scotland Bill has gone through. And I would just like your views on, on that. It's all very well talking about jagged edges. My concern is that uh, there's a lot more going on than jagged edges. 
and while we're talking about some of the small things that can be ironed out, there is a really big issue there, which is basically lack of money in Scotland. Yes. <laughs> I suppose um, there's the technical issue about what the powers are in the bill, and then there's a separate issue about how much money there is then available to, to use those powers in a way that, that um, actually helps um, alleviate and, uh, uh, poverty and stops more families falling into poverty. In terms of the, the actual legal powers, um, it, the bill is currently drafted it does allow top-up of reserved uh, benefits. Well, it's not clear at the moment if that allows top-up of tax credits. Um, neither is it clear if there's an extra test of need for a financial assessment to be applied individually or whether that can be uh, eligibility rules decided for a whole group nationally. So there are uncertainties there. So, if there are amendments in the pipeline, and there's some suggestion uh, recently um, in the Scotsman article that there might well be, then amendments that make it clear that the Scottish Government would have the power to top up tax credits as well as reserved benefits um, and can do that via nationally set entitlement conditions would be a welcome clarification. Um, in terms of how to use that power, I think although that might not have formed part of the original um, discussion about powers that were to be devolved, I think the question to be asked is what would happen if Scotland doesn't use those powers to top up tax credits and benefits. And we know that what will happen is that there is a forecast that many more children and families will fall into poverty over the next few years. Uh, with all the associated impacts that, that, that comes along with that on health, education and, and, and prospects. So it is, I would suggest, feasible, um, both legally and practically, to use the power to top up, for example, children's benefits, child benefit, child tax credit and universal credit child element, which is the equivalent of child tax credit. And the, that could be done to alleviate a number of things, primarily the freeze in benefits. That's one of the main drivers of the increase in po poverty. Um, so in the last five years, a family of two would have lost £900 in child I, benefit. I think what I'm trying to get at, though, Judith, is that the, the theory's fine. Right. You know, and I don't think you'll find anybody here that would disagree with the, the wish to do that, but what concerns me is how does a Scottish government get the funds to actually do these things? It's all very well having the power, you know, but as you said at the start, if you don't have the funds to back up that power, how do you do it? You look at raising taxes, well, that goes across all the, all the bands, so you're then into the jagged edge of raising tax on the lowest paid as well, perhaps. You know, you're then into the benefit cap, and there's lots of jagged edges around the benefit cap. There's the issue of giving one hand and taking away with the other. And I think what my concern is, really, is that we're, the possibility that we're creating expectations with people that it will be OK once the Scotland Bill is passed. But the reality is that we cannot um, say to people, yes, it will be okay, please don't worry about this. I think Fiona Colley wants to come in yeah, as well. Yeah, um, I, I, I think, I think um, uh, you make a reasonable point there. Um, yeah. And I think uh, there, there is expectation, but I'm not necessarily sure that the expectation is that there's suddenly going to be this... Um, you know, huge amount of money that's going to be able to solve everything. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the expectation is around a different way of uh, dealing with people, a different mm -hmm. way of treating people, 
a different way of delivering a system. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of conversations, particularly around in, in the Welfare Reform Committee um, and in, in the uh, wider civic society about how, what that might look like mm -hmm. um, and about treating people with dignity and, and also that it's much, trying to make it much, much easier for people to claim not just benefits, but to access the other services that are available to support them. And I think whilst we might not be able to create more money, mm -hmm. what we can do is change the way that people um, experience the benefit system, but also change the way ex they experience our public services um, and how they, they, they experience things like access to social care, access to a range of services, just to try and make that easier mm -hmm. for them. And are these discussions can, can, ongoing with both I'm, governments and, sorry, and the sector? Yes, they are. Okay, I, I guess, the, to sum that bit up before I come to Tavish, it might be feasible question is, are top-ups affordable, but there might be some redesign issues that we can do to make it easier in the journey for people, this, even though it might not be affordable, as effectively we are, I think. Tavish. Thank you. Can I just, on your earlier point, convener, about um, the training levy that was raised, I mean, it just strikes me that's not just a fiscal framework issue, that's a constitutional issue, because you can't have a levy on something which is devolved and then not have that money spent in Scotland, but uh, there we are. Um, you raised some interesting questions, Palmer Smith, on, on uh, the sanctions and conditionality regime and its incompatibility with programmes that SDS and, and others are uh, taking forward in Scotland. Um, a, uh, I guess any government has to have some kind of sanctions and, and conditionality regime, because uh, for the, all the reasons that we could obviously understand. So that's A. And B, um, if, and I absolutely take your point, there is going to be a basic and potential inconsistency between um, a regime that's designed for a programme that's happening south of the border and for that matter in Wales, Northern Ireland as well, so Northern Ireland is a different issue altogether, um, as opposed to Scotland. Your contention would presumably be that we should seek to have some ability to talk through that at ministerial level, government level, um, to try and deal with some of the, to, to deal with that basic inconsistency. Yeah. I, mean, I think we, there, there should be conditions for any public sector support. Yeah. It's how those conditions are arrived at and how they're enforced. And I think the, the risk and the danger that we see is that programmes are designed to meet unrealistic uh, conditionality uh, regimes and then the punitive measures of sanctions. Um, so I think we have to look at what is actually on offer and we have to look at how we're assessing the needs of individuals and what support is actually put in place to meet those needs. Um, having arbitrary th uh, figures like you must apply for X number of jobs, if you don't actually have the basic and core skills and if you couldn't actually compete and sustain a job, then that's an unrealistic action plan and target for a job seeker uh, who may well have other barriers to employment. So I think it's how we re-engineer uh, our support to individuals and I'd come back to how we actually join up some of the policy areas. So if we take ex-offenders, for example, 30% of their community service order can be dispensed on employability. So they can spend 30% of their community service hours looking at increasing their core skills, etc. So to some degree, that's an element of mandation. Mm. But it's a, a carrot and stick effect because one way of stopping reoffending is to get people into, into work. Mm. Um, and most people who are unemployed want a job. They just don't know how to go about getting a job. And the, those who have more multiple barriers are usually excluded and exclude themselves for fear of sanctions, mm -hmm. fear of exposure, fear of putting their head above the, the paraffin, and then they'll be, uh, they'll be pulled in. So I think it's how we engage with people that was said earlier, how we are looking to meet their needs, and how we join up different things that we do have control over as well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our vulnerable uh, job seekers will be in receipt of other services. So whilst the, the money and the austerity might have an impact on employability provisions, there are other monies uh, that are being directed at these individuals that we can look at packaging differently. So someone who's receiving tenancy support is equally having to up their core skills, their literacy, communication, IT, etc. And we, we can look at how we get multiple objectives met 
from the one public pound instead of continuing to operate services in silos. So I think our call is to have a much more integrated and aligned approach to individuals as opposed to just dealing with whatever badge they're presenting on that day, i.e. they're a job seeker, they're a care leaver, they're an ex-offender, they're a young carer, to actually look at the person in the round and look at our public services in the round and how we can actually better align them to get a better return on investment. So it doesn't always mean more money, it means we have to have a, a re-engineered or a redesigned approach. So any, sorry, one, so any, um, I take that absolutely, so any um, conditionality and, and sanctions uh, system, at the very least, would need to have some ability to recognise the, the conditions of the individual that that sanctions regime is being applied to, as opposed yeah. to what I get at the moment, yeah. which is a very broad yeah. brush wallop. You don't take that box, that's, that's you. Yeah. And I think we need the flexibility to be able to meet individuals' identified needs, not yeah. just the conditions of receiving benefit. Yeah, quite. You know, and I think that has to be at the heart of any, yeah. any service um, of moving people from welfare into work. But also when they're in work, employers also have a role uh, yeah. to play. Yeah, okay, that, thank that, you. That, 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 thanks, Tavis. That begs the question, and that coherence, breaking out the silos, making sure we have a more joined up approach. The access to work programme of this is not part of the devolved package, but very much part of the area what we're talking about. Do you think it would have been helpful if the access to work area had also been devolved to bring that more coherent approach? Yeah, I think all programmes are aimed at assisting people to enter and sustain employment and should be devolved so they can then be integrated as a full, a full package along with the other monies that are in the system. Mike? It's really building on uh, Pamela's point, and uh, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity in Scotland just now. The um, Scottish Government will be closing a, consult, a three month consultation tomorrow around uh, employability services uh, in Scotland. And um, uh, at the heart of the ask, if you like, for government is about how do we take a more, a, a more individualised approach uh, to employability in Scotland, so putting the, the individual at the centre of the, of the intervention. I think that um, uh, this, the, 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 this, this isn't just about the devolution, if you like, of, uh, of uh, the work programme and work choice. It's, a, it's an opportunity to engineer uh, um, the, the, um, the employability service that has been, has been running in Scotland for about seven or eight years, if you like, in the, in the current format, and, uh, and look at how do we, how do we take what the, the new the new powers and the new and the uh, and the new resources that we've got and uh, and have a much clearer landscape if you like uh, at the present time i think it's fair to say that uh, um, the, the the landscape currently is is, is is a bit messy there's this oil and water mix if you like between uh, um, devolved and reserved and uh, and it doesn't serve the customer uh, the young person or the individual uh, well in terms of trying to pull that together so just agreeing here with Pamela's point about the more that we get devolved in terms of uh, um, welfare and employability related services, then the better fit we can get with, uh, uh, in a Scottish context, uh, uh, um, uh, in terms of taking it forward into the next phase. Judith, you have a comment to make, then I'll come to Duncan. Uh, yes, two points, please, if I, if I may. One is that um, there's a crying need for more research in the area of conditionality and the impacts on claimants. There just isn't sufficient. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of taken as a given that conditionality and sanctions are the effective tool um, to help people into work. That may be so, but the evidence just simply isn't in place. And given that, as uh, Pamela says, conditionality isn't just something that's applied through DWP, but actually much more widely than that in already devolved services, that's particularly important to make sure that we do manage to integrate these programmes um, secondly, in terms of the new devolved powers, um, which are more narrow, um, the work programme in particular, um, although um, the, the powers over sanctions and conditionality aren't themselves being devolved, so somebody who's referred to the work programme by a job centre, if they don't attend, um, could be liable for a sanction. Once they actually engage and they're within that two-year or, or whatever it may be period of the work programme, 
Um, the powers then are devolved to decide what arrangements those should be and how heavy or how light the conditionality is then applied. So in fact, the guidance at the moment, which is set by DWP to work programme providers, um, tells them how to apply that. And it tells them, for example, um, to, to pay particular attention to people with mental health and learning dif difficulties if they're on ESA. It makes no similar um, um, suggestion that they uh, safeguard those vulnerable JSA claimants. There's no reason um, why a, a devolved work programme couldn't put those similar safeguards for JSA claimants and apply a much more thought-out um, approach um, that protects those people. There's no reason, I don't think, why it, that conditionality couldn't simply be switched off for ESA claimants who, after all, aren't, by definition, ready to go into work. They're simply ready um, to, take, to, look, to, to look at their health condition in relation to potential work and to take certain steps towards being more job ready. So I think there's a lot that can be done to ameliorate um, sanctions and, and the effects of those on the most vulnerable. Duncan. Yeah, and I'm going back the way again, I'm sorry, but um, you know, I think the, the question was, was, was raised earlier, I think, in and around uh, Linda's question about how the new benefit system in Scotland would fit in with uh, the tax raising powers or, or tax credit framework. And uh, we, we've had, um, I think, uh, from the Deputy First Minister, a position where he doesn't rule out um, uh, tax increases. And, 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 and a recent finance committee, the STUC, the STUC made uh, a very strong case that, um, that future tax rises would be necessary to tackle uh, inequality. So, I mean, if we could have some comment on that, I'm sure that you will have different views about how we could tackle uh, what we'd use that money for and how best we could tackle inequalities. And if you get any views on that, it would be, be quite, um, quite interested in those as well. There you go. Judith. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm a technician. I, um, my, my background is welfare rights. So what, what I know most about is, is um, how the tax credit system works rather than how the tax system works. Can I ask you a question specifically on that? Because I'm yes. not sure I get this in my mind, just to, to help the... Is tax credit a tax or is it a benefit? It's, it's um, a good question. It's not a tax, so I can be absolutely clear about that. It's not connected with the income tax system at all. Um, th there isn't actually a, a simple definition of what is a benefit, but, but a tax credit is more akin to being a benefit than anything else. Okay, sorry. It's just not because it's, it's delivered by HMRC. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but, I just, I, but that's been, since you mentioned it earlier, it's been going round my head which one right. was it, but yeah, it's not clear. It's a benefit. Okay. <laughs> it's a benefit, right. Sorry, uh, when you go. So, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not an expert in, in tax or those high-level economic things, but... It, to just state the obvious, our, our benefit system is, is paid for through taxation, and that's the mechanism that we use to, to, to tackle those inequalities. Um, and th there's a, a good argument that that's the mechanism that Scotland could use for its new powers over tax to, to look at how um, income across um, citizens can be better shared. And we have good mechanisms through benefits and tax credits to make sure that, that people in lower income bands get a better share of the national cake. Would that not be more appropriate in these circumstances if the basket of taxes to Scotland was much wider? Because then you, the risk-reward balance becomes much more um, easy to manage. Beyond the powers that are coming in, mm. in, a, in a couple of years' yeah. time. It's, it's not my area, I'm afraid. I, I don't think I've got the analysis to comment. MDLs? Um, I'm coming at it from a slightly different perspective in terms of uh, looking at the whole preventative approach and if you were investing um, additional monies to top up benefit or tax, then who gets the return on that investment? And I think what we have to start looking at is if we're looking at prevention in terms of poverty, um, poor health, etc., low education, then we again have to take a long-term view to say any tax that's raised is part of a preventative approach and it's an investment in the future. And in the future, you will have lower 
have to invest more amounts in health and well-being, in criminal justice and homelessness, etc., because you will have, in theory, citizens who are more productive, more prosperous, uh, able to um, meet their own way in life in terms through increased earnings. However, there's the other side of that. If you then use your tax raising power to top up benefit, how much further does the benefit get cut? And how much further do you then have to use those powers to subsidise um, issues that you have no control yeah. over? And I think it's a very difficult dilemma because there is only one pot of money. And I think we have to be able to take a much longer term view because we are looking at things from three years to the next, or in some cases, one year to the next. And if we were looking at a pure preventative approach, you're probably talking, you know, 10 to 15 years, at least to invest in uh, the social capital of your community, of your citizens, to actually start lifting those uh, embedded issues. Because individuals who are vulnerable have multiple issues and they have deprivation on a broad spectrum and it isn't only around income although it's uh, a well-known fact that increased income uh, alleviates a lot of the other issues but things are so embedded that it's going to take a you know a generation almost to try and uh, reverse in some of our communities particularly those where there are pockets of uh, deprivation social and economic uh, and how you actually deal with those communities as well as those individuals so i think there's a much broader issue around investment and how we invest in prevention and how in the long term we actually change the scenario, deal with the root cause instead of just putting on some sticking plasters to deal with the, the symptoms of the issue. Um, that would be my take okay. on it. Fiona, you want to come back in? Um, I would be inclined to agree with, with Pamela's view, um, I, I think when you talk about raising taxes, you have to look at why and what, what is it we want to achieve by doing that. Are we um, providing a stick and plaster for a problem just now, or are we looking to plan for the future? Um, an example would be, of, um, obviously, part of my field is around social care. An example would be the difficulties that many people face in, in getting the social care services that they need. Should we be if we're raising taxes, should we be investing in that because that helps individuals' health and well-being and reduces costs in another area? So I don't think we can, we can look at it in one area. I think we need to go look at what is it we're trying to achieve and what different elements of that um, uh, we may need to raise more money for or we may need to change policy and, and the bigger policy discussion about how things work better together um, sometimes is actually really, really important because for carers, one of the biggest things that provides them stress and makes them ill um, is trying to deal with a number of different systems, to deal with the benefit system, to deal with the social work system, to deal with health systems and a myriad of others. Um, so I think we just need to know why we're doing it and have a clear plan to make sure that we achieve what we want to do, that there's a purpose. I'm going to come to Rob now. Okay, I want to get into some, some more specific areas, particularly start on carers' issues. I was just going to say, you know, we've got to home in on how we can make better use of the limited pot, I think, for a start. Uh, but it's obvious to me that when we're talking about dealing with people differently and more caringly, uh, that that perhaps goes hand in hand with uh, reducing the bureaucracy that there is that they have to face up to in these different systems so that you actually perhaps can reduce the costs of administration and use more money up front. And uh, because uh, thinking about carers allowance, it's an earning replacement benefit and therefore subject to overlapping benefit rules. What's the opinion of the panel about the overlapping benefit rule? Um, is it a necessary part of a social security system? And if so, should it apply to carers? Fiona. Well, maybe I'll answer the second part of that. Um, I think it is problematic that it applies to carers um, because caring is a reality across age groups. Um, and it's, um, I, as I, I think I mentioned earlier on, particularly um, for um, 
uh, people who are receiving the state pension simply do not understand why their carer's allowance is taken away from them. Their caring duties don't end. Um, and I think our view is that whilst um, a carer's allowance should be seen as an independent income for carers, it should also be seen as a recognition of the caring role that somebody has. And that should be across age groups. It should be, for example, if someone has a, has a disability, some of the disability can be a carer. Um, about 20% of carers have a long-term condition um, or disability. So people have, with disabilities, older people um, are, are providing care already. So I think there's a problem with it in that extent, but also there's a problem in just trying to explain it to people. I, I, <laughs> to try it, when someone phones up and you say, well, you can, you've got to apply for carers allowance, but you'll get a letter that says you qualify for carers allowance, but we're not going to pay, for, pay you it, but you've, you've established the underlying entitlement and you need to take this letter to the pension service or, and um, you may get an addition to your pension credit. It's really, really difficult to explain to people and they go, why? And quite often go, actually, I'm not going to bother. So it's a barrier, particularly a barrier to um, older people. And we know that access to pension credit opens up other passported benefits and other passported support. So um, I think that, that our view that there needs to be something to, to prevent that problem occurring, um, whether the overlapping benefit rule remains or not, um, we need to try and change the system to make it much more clearer for people how they access the income replacement part of it, the, um, uh, the, so the universal credit and the um, pension credit elements, and they don't have to create all these additional problems for them. So, uh, have others in the panel got to view on the overlapping benefits rule, etc.? Yeah, let's hear about that. Uh, Just, we know that carers in, uh, anywhere, but it's, a, it's quite a broad church in terms of geography, um, age and, uh, and stage of development. Um, I suppose from, from, from my perspective, uh, my interest lies in ensuring that, that um, uh, benefits and allowances and so on don't get in the way of his being able to provide an equitable service to carers, um, allow them to access a, 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 skills, in, a, a skills intervention uh, if required to allow them to develop their ongoing skills and participate in society uh, as well. So, um, so it goes back to um, an earlier point just about, uh, about ensuring that there's an alignment between um, uh, employability and welfare, if you like, as well, um, to, 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 to allow uh, an equal access uh, to, um, to, to the services that are available across Scotland. Okay, Rob, is it, you got enough out of that, do you think? No, I was just going to ask a little a, a added bit to it. You know, um, the definition of a carer's benefit in the Scotland Bill has been criticised as being too limited uh, as to not allow people who are gainfully employed under 16 or in full-time education to qualify. But it also limits the amount of uh, hours that they can work. Um, have you got a view about the potential for simplifying that and opening it up? Uh, Judith Patterson? Yes, I mean, I don't think that the um, overlapping benefit as a feature is necessary to carers' allowance. Um, and as Fiona says, particularly for people over pension age, it leads to a lot of confusion because most of them are on a benefit that it overlaps with, i.e. state retirement pension. So you do end up in a position where you're claiming a benefit that you're never going to get. <laughs> and you're advised to claim it, and that's the correct advice. You get a letter saying, uh, good news, you're not entitled. But um, actually, you do get extra means-tested entitlement, so it's worthwhile. But a ridiculously convoluted... Um, process. Um, however, for working age people, um, the overlap is with benefits like job seekers allowance and employment and support allowance, um, which is perhaps um, it has some justification. The overlapping benefits generally isn't used so much in the benefit system as it used to be. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a um, dying out breed. N generally, the divisions between benefits are dealt with by the fundamental entitlement conditions themselves. So you don't get entitled to one benefit if you're entitled to another. Carer's allowance is not dealt with in that way. It does overlap. Now, 
I think what needs to be considered is what is carers' allowance paid for. So for some people, it's paid because they can't they don't they can't combine work and their carer responsibility. So the benefit is replacing those earnings. This is an earnings replacement benefit. For other people, it's because they have extra costs associated with their caring responsibilities, perhaps because they don't um, live with the disabled person that they care for. So they have extra costs of travel, for example, all kinds of things. So that suggests two possible types of carers allowance, one extra costs and one earnings replacement. It could even be one benefit with two different types of allowance combined within that benefit to, to, to help people with those different costs. Extra cost benefits in the system traditionally don't overlap with anything. They're like DLA or like PIP. They're, um, they, they're paid on top of any means-tested benefits and uh, are generally very helpful and more straightforward and universal. So that would be a very straightforward, streamlined, claimant-friendly direction to take carers' allowance in. Um, if, you did, if you got rid of overlapping benefits altogether, including for people who came out of work in order to claim, then you'd be in the situation potentially of people being compensated through GSA at £70-odd pounds, plus through carers' allowance at £70-odd pounds, which some people might feel was unfair. So you could have an earnings replacement part and an extra costs part. Fiona, can I just, Rob, ask a specific around the definition as well? Can I ask for a comment from you on the definition issue? For 16 years. Sorry, from Fiona. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, to, to be honest, we, we're quite concerned about it. Um, we feel that there should be, uh, uh, that the flexibility should be there to enable the Scottish Parliament to look at what carers allowance should look like. If, if we put restrictions on it, it, it creates complications. Um, for example, particularly the study rule, um, I, I personally know a lot of carers who study um, and a number who have chosen to study full time and have lost their carers allowance, um, yet they're still caring. And, and I think this is the key element of it, is um, carers allowance is called an earnings replacement benefit. But I, I really don't know how you could say £62 is an earnings replacement benefit. Um, so it's meant to be an earnings replacement benefit and thus um, uh, things like work and, 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 and study um, are are not necessarily meant to be off limits, but it's meant to, it's meant to compensate for you, for you to be able to do that. Um, I think what we need to change is it's a recognition of caring. That's simply what it is. It's a recognition of caring. It's an independent income for carers in their own right. They may have an opportunity to top that up through employment, um, but the reality is, is for a lot of carers, um, it's simply not going to be possible. Um, um, so I'm, I, I think your, your idea around having the, 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 the earnings part of it, but also having the carer recognition part of it is a very good one. But the fundamental point you're making is, regardless how we might design it, and that, because these are design, design issues for the future, currently, as far as you understand the bill, we don't have the ability to make that, to, to, to design how we want it to work. Yeah, we're, we're, we're concerned that the way it's drafted that, yeah, that so it is too, too, to, okay. too well, restrictive. We'll just make sure we get that Yes, but, I mean, we'd had, we'd, we'd had some discussions which indicated there would be flexibility, but um, following on from that, there'd been a... Um, uh, uh, a statement around the, 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 the debate in the House of Commons um, uh, by the Minister for State that, would, that seemed to indicate, indicate otherwise right. that there was, in, their, in, in her opinion, good reasons for those restrictions remaining in Mark, relation to other state support. Sorry, Mark, was it a supplementary to that? Other, otherwise, I was going to bring Malcolm in. Could well, Fiona has gone into the issue around the discussions that have been taking place, which is an area I well, want to... Let, let me come back to that, because there, okay. may, be other, there may be other areas where... That generic question will apply to, if you see where I'm coming from. So, I wanted to ask about childcare, but just for, following on from what you've discussed there, I mean, most of the jagged edge we're, we're discussing are within working age benefits, but clearly the last discussion was really the relationship <coughs> between carers' allowance and the, pen, uh, the pension uh, system. And I wonder whether, in fact, the housing element of universal credit is another example of that, because... Uh, we, I think the, the Scottish Parliament is being given powers to vary the housing element of universal credit, 
that when you become of pension age, I think housing becomes part of pension credit. So I just wondered if that is another jagged edge and whether that's just something else we have to live with or whether anything can be done about that. Jeff? I mean, it, it absolutely is a jagged edge. I think in the briefing paper that Spice have produced, they've, they've illustrated that very clearly, how the Scottish Government would have, for example, the power to top up the local housing allowance rate so that people renting in the private sector had a wider choice of tenancies that they could, that they could, that they, that they could live in, but that power is, would stop at um, pension credit age, um, leading to the you know, palpably unfair situation of, of somebody... Um, losing money at pension credit age towards their rent if nothing was done about it. Um, potentially having to um, move house at that point. Um, does the Scottish Parliament, would the, would the Scottish Parliament have powers to, to do anything about that? Well, um, I, again, I think you'd, you'd need to be looking at whether there were top-up powers to reserved benefits that might actually allow something to be done about that particular jagged edge, um, which would mean supporting people on pension credit then throughout. Um, so I, I think potentially there's, there's action that could be taken. I think it would be um, a, a, a shame if the powers weren't used for people of working age, because that was seen to be an insurmountable problem. I, I okay, well, I, was really, I think, I think that, that was a helpful clarification. But what I was wanting to home in on was the comment in your own paper, again from the Child Poverty Action Group, in terms of more immediate opportunities to reduce childcare costs faced by parents, CPAG believes that in order to focus support on those on lower incomes, the most effective approach would be to use new powers to top up benefits, to top up childcare support within working tax credit, universal credit. And the context of that is you're ad, uh, advocating that compared to the UK government's tax-free child care scheme. I don't know a lot about that scheme because it's not come in yet. I suppose one question in relation to that is whether the UK government would still pay the £2 into Scottish people who were contributing to that scheme. But I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that question. Uh, but um, I suppose the main question really is in relation to the topping up of child care support. I mean, obviously that's been flagged up by the UK government this week as something that could be done. Although Linda's point remains, it would obviously be uh, how would you pay for it. But um, I just wonder um, whether, you know, how you see that and, again, whether there would be any potential knock-on consequences from that in terms of adverse uh, effects somewhere else in, the, um, in terms of people's family income. Um, I, I think in terms of the tax-free childcare scheme, you're, you're, you're quite right, it's not in force yet. Um, but in our view, it's not a scheme that's going to help um, parents on the lowest incomes by its very design. And there are very problematic aspects of it as well. The most um, uh, problematic one being that parents have got to make a choice between claiming a tax credit or tax-free childcare. That's not a choice between claiming childcare support within tax credits. You have to, to take or leave your entire tax credit award in order to take up tax-free childcare. If you make the wrong choice, you, you end up being um, much, much worse off. Um, so that's not a happy position um, for claimants to, to be in. I think the, ch the choices that they need to make are complex enough without being presented with one with such dire consequences. Um, so uh, the tax-free childcare scheme is, 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 is not one that supports the people who need the, the help the most. Um, so in the long term, our preference would be that the childcare system is funded on the supply side um, so that there's funding put into, into high-quality childcare with universal access and um, parental contributions are, are capped. Um, however, that might be more of a longer-term ambition. So in the short term, we do have a system to, to help um, parents with their uh, childcare costs, and that is a tax credit system that will be moving towards universal credit over the next few years. So at the point that Scotland is able to use these powers, that will be further down the road. But there will still be a large cohort of tax credit claimants, as well as a growing cohort of universal credit claimants. So in order to be fair and not to introduce more jagged edges, top-ups would need to be considered for both those 
cohorts, which obviously pre presents um, um, issues in, in relation to working with both HMRC, who deliver tax credits, and with DWP, who deliver universal credit. Um, but, but I think there are, it is feasible, it, it can be done, and uh, cooperation with DWP in terms of universal credit needs to happen anyway because there are direct powers in relation to universal credit. It seems to me entirely possible to work with the DWP to put in place other um, Scottish specific measures. And with child tax credit, with, with tax credits rather, that's a, 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 a ta the tax credits are going to be diminishing in, this, in importance in the system over time. Um, so a, a way might need to be found to directly compensate tax credit claimants if um, it it's proves more difficult to work with HMRC for that to happen within the system. But again, I think that's doable. In the long run about the supply side and also um, about the top-ups, do, do, do you, can you actually tell us in terms of those presumably um, people earning on higher incomes, whether they would, under the UK government's proposals, uh, benefit from the tax free child, because as you're understanding, that would still be, they would still get the advantage of that if they were parents in uh, better play employment who didn't get tax credits. Um, I, I think you've got to, uh, I haven't got the analysis in my head, but yeah, yes, uh, um, uh, parents in better paid work could be better off with tax free childcare than on tax credits. Some, some parents will be entitled to tax credits at all. And with the tax credits um, becoming less generous, in any case over time, there'll be more parents coming out of the tax credit system and relying um, on their wages alone. Those parents could benefit from tax free childcare. But, you, but given that income taxes devolve, your understanding is they'll still be able to get the tax relief from the UK government? I, I think so. That, that, uh, as far as I understand it, the tax-free childcare system it has got connections with the income tax system, but it's not actually a fundamental right, okay. part of it. It's not delivered through right, okay. income tax as, right. as a tax allowance or, or as a tax refund. Right. The, the, mm. the connection is you, you, you actually set up a different account, right, okay. and for every mm, right. um, £8 that a parent puts in, the government puts in two. Right, okay. um, mm. So that sort of 80p, 20p split reflects the basic rate of, of, of tax. Um, however, it's not paid or collected through the tax system, right, okay. so it is separate. So, okay. yes, it should be should applicable be in Scotland too. This is all fascinating stuff in terms of the, <laughs> it's, it's detailed and it's deep, but it does. It's beginning to lead, I'm sorry, this is just me where I am, folks, I'm feeling a bit frustrated because what we're really saying here is what we're going to implement is a very expensive bandage system. Very expensive elastoplasts are going to have to be applied to a system that's not working, that we might not be able to afford elastoplasts to actually do the job. So that's a heck of a frustration I'm getting myself into around these, these issues. Mark. Yeah, well, I was, I was going to say on that, convener, around, you know, I think that there's a distinction between feasibility and affordability in, in, these, in these terms and, and wh whether something can be practically done and whether something can actually be afforded are two different things. The other thing I just wanted to check was, in terms of the feasibility around the tax credit system, at the moment tax credits are administered through HMRC, not through DWP, so they're technically not classified as a benefit, they're more of a sort of a tax rebate. So under the, the proposals that as are framed in the Scotland Bill, would, would they not find themselves excluded because issues around you know, tax allowances, tax <coughs> rebates are not going to be devolved as part of the tax powers that would come to this parliament? I, I, I think, again, to make the, the, the distinction that the convener helpfully brought out earlier on, tax credits aren't a tax. Um, the, the, they are much more akin to a benefit. You're, you're absolutely right. It's not clear in um, the Scotland Bill what comes under the umbrella of, of, of benefit. Uh, it's not clear whether that would include tax credits or, 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 or not. But, but one would expect that it should. So the clarification ought to bring that with, within the umbrella of, um, the, of, of potential top-ups, um, powers to, to, to top up benefits and tax credits. Okay. Um, they, they used to be part of the benefit system. They, they were renamed and given to HMRC to administer, but the essential characteristics have remained the same. They're not through the tax credit system. So I, I, I think it's certainly 
possible and with some clarification um, it, we, that will be helpful that Scotland will have powers to top up tax credits. Okay. Well, I wanted to talk about the, the clarifications and the discussions that have been had. And obviously, you're here giving evidence to this committee. You've had input to the Scottish Government in terms of the, the approach they're taking. What direct approaches, discussions have you had with the UK Government? Because at the end of the day, the amendments that are tabled, the amendments that are accepted by the Government are the gift of well, the Secretary of State and, and, and the UK Government. What, what discussions have you had in, the, in those respects across the, the witnesses? When you go for your... <laughs> yeah. um, we, um, obviously, I, I, I don't work alone. Um, I've been working my, with my colleagues at Carers UK mm -hmm. um, and they've been meeting um, with um, various um, ministers and officials from across um, the UK Government, across the DWP, um, and across, uh, uh, along the process that we've been, we've been seeking amendments, we've been seeking clarification and working with um, um, MPs, and, uh, MPs from each of the parties. Um, obviously, it's now um, the next stage, it's now moving into the Lords and, and a similar process will take place where we try to seek amendment there and we try to get support for that amendment from all sides. Um, it, it's probably broadly similar from, from what I do here. Um, um, my colleagues, at, my colleagues in, in London, are, are working with us. Of course, um, are seeking to, to get the same amendments and get the same clarification. Um, and obviously, we're still in a position where we don't have all those answers and we don't have all the clarification. Um, and I think that, as I said, it's very important that we get that as soon as we can. Any other witnesses want to? I think basically most of our representations are through COSLA and a lot of the things, uh, a lot of the opinion is aligned to Scottish Government, so a lot of it is joint representation uh, through local government, Scottish Government to the UK Government. Uh, I don't think we have been campaigning on any separate issue or have any different uh, view from what we're promoting through Scottish Government, uh, apart from when it comes to the the devolution, obviously, we'll then be looking at what then comes to local government and we'll have a different debate with Scottish government around that. Can, Mark, can I just, just ask a very general question? I, listen, of course. To, to everybody, is anything, and you, you've obviously been trying hard to get things changed in terms of the amendments and the discussions that are going on. Has anyone at any stage had any uh, movement or change in anything you've suggested or seen any movement or change so far? Convener. I do apologise. Uh, convener, just um, uh, the, the, the key one is, is the one I raised about the eight-week eight rule that came up and, um, and uh, we, we have asked uh, for clarification. We were, um, we, were, uh, we were hoping to get that. For us, there's a, there's a time scale here because we're in a commissioning process around the Employability That's Fund. Right. And we've asked, we've asked UK government to give us clarification. We asked for it. We were, we were told we'd get something in August. We are told we'd get something uh, on the 3rd of September. But we haven't received um, any clarification on that as yet. So, is there anyone... Repeat that question. Is anyone, in terms of the lobbying you've been doing, seen any changes or any impact from... You might have had impact, but have you heard... Has there been any movement by the UK government in terms of what you're trying to do? I think okay. that's probably clear by the fact that there, obviously there was no amendment um, accepted. At, at, at the no, I just, I'm just trying to get that on the record so that. Yes, yeah. I'm, so I just I'm, don't so assume that the amendments yeah. were put in and weren't taken. Um, so. Thank you. <laughs> Stuart. Thank you. Um, apologies, I had to leave uh, to deal with another matter, so I may have missed this, but just in case it hasn't been asked, I mean. It follows on from Mark's questions, I suppose, about um, you know, the practicality and affordability, the ability to do something and the ability to afford something. Um, I've listened this morning very carefully, and I've heard a whole range of issues where we could top up or add new benefits. And there's lots of other ones that have come at other meetings and other evidence and all that. Um, can you put a figure on how much that will cost? No, um, I, I can't put a figure on that. We haven't done that kind of analysis. If, well, can you put um, a figure on, on how much the suggestions you've made this morning will cost? I, uh, I think we could, we could look at 
that because uh, these welfare cuts are, are you know, they were announced in the summer. Um, the powers that the Scottish Government might or might not have have been unclear. So the suggestion to use the powers is, is, is kind of, it's a fairly new one. Um, so mm. I think we'd need to do that analysis to, and we're prepared to do that to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, we need to look at what, the, helpful, what the impacts... It sounds very expensive. And, but I, I think that information is probably out there in relation to the impact statements that the DWP have produced on the, the cost of their cuts in the UK. So it probably could be analysed to work out the cost for Scotland. But I suppose against that you'd have to put aside the costs. That's one side of the, the equation, the direct costs of um, topping up. The other side of it is the cost of not doing anything and the knock-on effects on, on health and education and so forth, because the, the reality is those families will have less money and they will be presenting to other services for, for support. So one way or another, the consequences will have to be dealt, dealt with in Scotland. But Linda's got a supplementary, and then I think... That supplementary. Sorry. It's, it's something from way back. Something from way back. Okay. <laughs> Let's get way back to, back to the future. Way, way back. back uh, it, future. It, was just, it was talking again about um, you know, work programmes and things like that, sanctions and conditionality. And I was getting a bit confused about you know, some of the things that were being said um, in relation to sanction applied, but there may be an element of conditionality that, that could be done in Scotland, which is not what I've been picking up by what we're talking about here. Um, you know, when I've been looking at the Scotland Bill and, and doing some background reading, it would seem to me that the conditionality is going to stay at Westminster unless that very much gets changed. So uh, I would like a quick view on that and the reality of it and whether, in fact, it would be much easier all round if the whole thing was devolved in terms of the conditionality aspects of the work programme, etc. Our experience, um, our belief is that the conditionality will remain and the yeah. effects and impact will remain. Yeah. And it would certainly be a lot neater if it was all devolved and we could re-engineer our, our total uh, uh -huh. kind of system there. Um, whether there is flexibility is, is another issue as to how they are then applied. Right. Um, and I think it has been quite variable across the 32 local authorities how sanctions are applied and also how the work programme providers um, refer people for sanctioning. Right. A lot of it is quite subjective. In their view, they haven't complied or they haven't given a good enough rationale as to why they didn't do X or do Y. So there is some subjectivity in sending people for sanctioning right, so well. that's perhaps what I was picking up. Uh -huh. right. Listen, unless somebody else has got any other questions, I think this is probably... Thank you got to the end of its, the process here. I'm very grateful to you folks for coming along. This is an incredibly complex area and, and with many threads to it. So I'm grateful for you trying to make it more visible to us about what all this means. So, again, thanks very much for coming along. Um, we, we meet again next on... 29th of um, October. Uh, can I also give late apologies for Alison Johnson? She put, put a note in to ourselves after the start of the meeting. There are very understandable reasons why she couldn't manage today. So, with that, I close the meeting and thank you very much. <laughs>